The Lectures in History podcast is taking a break this week, but C-SPAN has you covered with an episode from Season 2 of Presidential Recordings. This episode features secretly recorded phone calls between President Richard Nixon, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, and CIA Director Richard Helms. Well, Congressman, I think crime is a very dangerous cancer. It flourishes where it's ignored and uh, where the community is not alert to it being a truly local problem. Uh, It can't exist without a certain amount of apathy upon the part of the local citizens. Uh, Local crime, I believe, can be brought within control by stern measures, not only by the law enforcement officers, but by the courts that have to deal with the criminals that are brought before them, and by the community at large. No community receives any better kind of law enforcement than it desires and insists upon. I assured Mr. Gray that the CIA had no involvement in the break-in, no involvement whatever. And it was my preoccupation consistently from then to this time to make this point and to be sure that everybody understands it. It doesn't seem to get across very well for some reason, but the agency had nothing to do with the Watergate break-in. I hope all the newspaper men in the room hear me clearly now. That's FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and CIA Director Richard Helms. When Richard Nixon took office, J. Edgar Hoover was already one of the most powerful figures in American history, having served as the nation's top cop going back to Calvin Coolidge. Richard Helms was the quintessential spy. He had joined the CIA at its founding in 1947 and rose through its ranks to lead it. Coming up, we'll listen in on the roles both played in the Nixon White House. First, joining us by phone, Luke Nichter. He's the creator and editor of NixonTapes.org and author or editor of books including, with Douglas Brinkley, The Nixon Tapes, 1971 to 1972, and The Nixon Tapes, 1973. Professor Nichter, please describe the relationship between Richard Nixon and J. Edgar Hoover and whether they knew each other before Mr. Nixon became president. Well, Richard Nixon and J. Edgar Hoover went back a long ways. Uh, they were neighbors in Washington. Uh, Hoover got to know uh, uh, Nixon and vice versa early in Nixon's time in, in Washington. He was first elected as a congressman in 1946. And where they really got to know each other was uh, why Nixon was on the House Un-American Activities Committee during the investigation of a uh, suspected spy, Alger Hiss. Uh, and the FBI was more than happy to assist Nixon's investigation, provide evidence. And it was really the result of that investigation that made Nixon a, a household name and really a rising political star in the Republican Party. Now, topics in the calls we're about to hear include the uh, very high-profile killings of two New York City police officers in 1971, where we hear President Nixon get Mr. Hoover's support for tougher law enforcement policies. Please tell us more about this incident. Sure. Well, I mean, Nixon and Hoover were were two law and order cold warriors. And I think that kind of speaks to their number one uh, domestic issue, uh, tough on crime, and uh, international issue, uh, Cold War and anti-communism. Uh, and, and in fact, when you look at their, their, their long careers and associations, it's hard to find two other politicians or political people who knew each other as long. And uh, I can say I'm aware of no significant disagreements ever, you know, between them. Uh, and Nixon ultimately was elected on a get tough on crime message. And it was Hoover's FBI uh, who helped him to carry out that promise. Uh, and in this uh, case, I think Nixon, what we hear is Nixon's very eager to get the facts. He's very eager to find out um, uh, what motivated uh, the, the, the shootings, uh, the perpetrators. And uh, Hoover is quite happy to have the support of the boss, so to speak, of the White House uh, in terms of uh, going, after, uh, going after criminals. And uh, it was under Nixon's presidency that, in fact, the FBI was very aggressive in going after crime and especially organized crime. Now, President Nixon and Mr. Hoover also talk about the Supreme Court decision on the Pentagon Papers in July of 1971. What were those papers and what did the Nixon administration want the high court to do? 
the Pentagon Papers just simply caused a rupture uh, in, in the Nixon White House. Uh, the, the, the actual study was a 40-volume, 7,000-page report written in the late 1960s at the end of the presidency of Lyndon Johnson uh, of really how the U.S. came to be involved uh, in Vietnam. And by the time the study was written, how things started to go badly for the United States. Uh, after portions of these documents were leaked to the New York Times, which started to publish them in June of 1971, uh, the Nixon, what the Nixon administration did was it sought to get an injunction against the New York Times uh, from any further publication of the, the reports. Uh, the Nixon White House went all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, and, and this remains one of the most important First Amendment cases in U.S. history. The Supreme Court issued a mixed decision that uh, ultimately permitted publication of the Pentagon Papers to continue. Now, we'll also hear calls between President Nixon and the CIA director at the time, Richard Helms. Was their relationship different from that of the president and Mr. Hoover? Yes, it was. Uh, unlike uh, Nixon and Hoover, uh, Helms and Nixon were, were really never personally close. Uh, Nixon knew him from his uh, Nixon's days as vice president under Dwight Eisenhower. And I think Nixon always wondered about Helms, uh, as he did of others who worked at the, the CIA, uh, whether Helms was actually more loyal to the CIA than, than to the president he served. Now, Iran is the topic of one of these calls. Please describe the relationship between Iran and the U.S. at the time of this call, January 1973. So to set the stage, January 1973, uh, Nixon's uh, inaugurated. He's beginning his second, what he thought would be his second full uh, four-year term. He's uh, looking for a place to, to move Helms. I think Nixon hopes to have his own guy uh, appointed to the CIA, to run the CIA. And he's looking for a place to, to put Helms. That's the problem. What do you do with him? Uh, and so uh, ultimately, he's, he's uh, looking for an ambassadorship to send him to. And he has his eye, uh, he has his eye on Iran. Uh, which is a quite close ally of the U.S. at the time. Uh, Reza Pahlavi is the Shah of Iran. Uh, he's a source of stability in the region in the eyes of the U.S. And both Nixon and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger sought to sort of build him up to be a kind of regional power to stand up to the Soviet Union and Soviet influence in the Middle East. Luke Nichter, creator and editor of NixonTapes.org and author or editor of books including, with Douglas Brinkley, The Nixon Tapes, 1971 to 72, and The Nixon Tapes, 1973. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We begin on May 26th, 1971. President Nixon and FBI Director Hoover talked about the killing of those two New York City police officers. Edgar? Yes, Mr. President. You're probably way, way ahead of me, but may I tell you that uh, in terms of the New York situation, uh, at this particular time, since these people have not been apprehended, the national security you know, information we seek yes. is unlimited. Yes. Okay. It's okay. Yes. On that line, I. And you'll tell you tell the, uh, the the attorney general that that's what I've suggested and well ordered, and you do it. Okay. I'll do that. Uh, Don't you agree with this? I agree with it thoroughly. My God, let's get these bastards. And uh, the uh, agent in charge of my New York office told me he attended both funerals today. Good. And uh, saw the commissioner and conveyed to the commissioner as he had previously on to the other high offices there at New York that the full facilities of the FBI were available. Good. And we'll make them available, and I'll go for all out on the intelligence in this thing. Yeah. In the meantime, I've already alerted the president of the National Association of Chiefs of Police Good. to hold himself in readiness for Wednesday, for Wednesday or Thursday of next week yeah. and to have his officers hold that day open as they will be called good. to Washington for some conference. I didn't good. indicate what good. it was. That'll be a good meeting, and then we'll follow that up with the... Uh on their recommendation with a meeting of, say, a uh, hundred top police and sheriffs from around the country. And we and have that scheduled for the following Monday. Right. Already. Oh, good. Yes. Good. Oh, you have. Oh, yes, indeed. That's great. That's the way to work. Yes. And then we'll get at this, and then we'll, uh, and then I'll come by the academy and give them a little pop, and we'll... Fine. Okay. Fine. Fine. But let's get these guys. By God, uh, you know, it just sickens me to see people shooting policemen in the back. It does. Doesn't it? You? I mean, I just, of course it does you, but it does me as a, just 
It's just an ordinary citizen. Uh, when you stop to think of, of this thing in New York, where one man, as I said today, was shot six times in the back of the head and another man 12 times in the back of the head. Oh, my God. Now, that was not, uh, I mean, it wasn't... That's sadism, sadism. That was sadism, that's just what it was. That's right, and the New York Times will probably write an editorial pointing out that the guy that shot him was raised in a bad neighborhood. Yes, it'll be poverty, yes. That's right. Uh, the, the slums of New York... That's right. ...contributed to it. That's right. ...housing and all that sort of thing. But that isn't the reason. These people are bad people. Of course not. Right. Okay, Edgar. I'll keep this Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The two men talked again two days later, and the president asked Director Hoover for his support on tougher federal law enforcement laws. They mentioned New York City Police Commissioner Patrick Murphy. I was uh, doing a little thinking last night, and uh, uh, you notice where this clown uh, Harrison Williams was uh, claiming that uh, we, uh, uh, were, that he said that the, we were, Trials was blocking an attempt to let the FBI go in and do uh, yes. help out. And of course, we answered that, Clint East answered, and we answered here. And of course, you know, the directive in November covers that. And, it I, does. and I also saw your letter, which indicated, my God, in, in New York, you're practically running the thing. They are? Well, which is good. I mean, I mean you're running it. You uh, see, uh, Mr. President, yeah. in all of the killings of police officers, as I pointed out, I think, in a recent memorandum to you, uh, the local police, within 30 days, apprehend 96 and a half percent. It's just one thing where we aren't needed. Here's what I had in mind. Uh, now, let me just run this by you to think yeah. about it, and I'll yes. answer and I don't, and I'm not thinking of a public announcement on this, incidentally, uh, so, so much as to just as a question of, uh, uh, of tone and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> first, I think it would be, uh, the reason we've got to oppose something like the Schweiker bill is it would get the Bureau immediately involved in every police. That's test. very true. And this we must not do. That would be a national right. police thing. Right. That we mustn't have. The second thing is, however, on the other hand, if on a case-by-case -case basis you could determine that you would want the bureau to get in, in other words, where you sort of had the scent or the smell of of a na of a of, of the national conspiracy thing, yes. you know, then that's a different matter. Now, would it <clears throat> uh, would it be, for, for example, possible to say something like this if uh, you were to get a directive uh, to the effect that? Uh, that, uh, and of course, this would have to be by, uh, with, I suppose, approval by the Attorney General or, I don't know, or something like that. Yes. Thought through, where it said that in where law enforcement officials, officials I mean, where, where there are attacks on law enforcement officials and where there is, there is evidence of or suspicion of, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, na of, of conspiratorial or uh, not conspiratorial but you know what I mean other, other than just the crime of violence yes you know the the kind of thing like the Panthers and like all that always right so Democrats are right it's something that where, where it's basically that kind of a of an action yes but then the Bureau on a case-by-case -case basis uh, should go in and will go in and and uh, do everything that it can now what I'm really trying to get at is this is to give you a, is to find a way to get a handle so that you could go in only on cases where you wanted, and uh, where there, were, and that would mean cases where it did appear as if it were this other thing. And then, second, to go in with everything you've got. In other words, you could uh, with uh, surveillance, uh, electronic, and everything. I, I, is is that already covered, or what is? Uh, well, what you I tell you what is being done. Uh, it might be well to consider a public statement along that line. But uh, New York, for instance, uh, uh, we've got now uh, I think uh, 80 men on a special squad, and I've instructed the, the assistant director of New York to take it as a bureau case and break it as a bureau case if they possibly can. Uh, but without ruffling the feelings of the local authorities, but don't, but don't tell the local authorities we've taken over. I see. In other words, it doesn't relieve the Commissioner well, Murphy of, yeah. the, of the responsibility of doing the job. Well, and of course, if he knew that we were taking it over, yeah. he probably would uh, scream to high heaven or leak something to the press. Right. Now, we've done the same thing down south with this little girl uh -huh. who was uh, murdered, you know. Right. And well, now, that's, that's what I had in mind as far as procedures yes. concerned. So, uh, down 
off, you're doing that because of the violence civil, right, civil the rights. Possibility of civil rights. Right. Of course, now the local authorities have got these four white fellows locked up, and they will try them, I guess, for murder. But in the meantime, we want to make certain if there's any federal jurisdiction, uh -huh. and the local authorities kind of begin to back off or go easy, then we can yeah. go into the federal court on civil rights cases. Well, now, if our if Ziegler is asked about that case, could he say that uh, that the FBI? Well, I suppose it's already. Is it out that you are investigating to see if there's any civil rights thing or something like that? I don't know whether it's out. I know we went into it immediately yeah. upon happening. Fine. Well, now, with regard to the New York... And I think Mr. Ziegler could, with, if that question regard, is asked, right. could say so. Yeah, with regard to the uh, police thing now, uh, what I'm getting at is that I want to get a position where we can... Uh, where, you know, my God, a fellow like William Driggs, he ought to be in jail himself. Well, he is. Well, of course, yeah. he's a cheap politician. Yeah, well, you know, the fellow's got a, you know, he's got a very shady reputation. For crying out loud. And for him to take, because what, I, what I'm really trying to get at is a way to, 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 so that, to reassure people that we are doing everything we can. I know you are. I want to keep the Bureau out of everything that it doesn't want to get into. Yes. I don't want to do anything that will get the Bureau in trouble. I'll tell you what I plan, but, but if there's any more handle that you need, I'll sign a directive to you if you want. Uh, what I'll I, have the Attorney General sign one. What I well. plan to do, uh, Mr. President, I've ordered these chiefs of police in here for next Wednesday afternoon. After I, after I meet them? No, before oh, yes. you meet them. Oh. I want to get them in here in my office, and I yeah. want to go down about this Williams bill and these other bills, up, yeah. about a dozen up there, to get them all in office position to it. Good. On Good. the grounds that they have batted 96.5%. Right. And I have in mind telling them that after the conference with you at the White House on yeah. Thursday, yeah. if after that conference the press asks them any questions about the line of, of statements they should make. Right. In other words, that uh, they are doing it and they're getting the fullest cooperation from the yeah. FBI yeah. and all that sort of thing. Right. In other words, I wanted to get them lined up as to yeah. the, the atmosphere. Now, right. I, and we intend to do the same thing in regard to the 100 that come in the following Monday for yeah. three days training. Mm -hmm. Because both of those groups you will speak to. Yeah. But uh, I, I thought these uh, officers who are coming in from the sheriffs and the police chiefs, that uh, I want to get them in, the, in this room here and uh, yeah. just tell them what the picture is and what the opposition, our, our opposition did to, yeah. to a bill being enacted yeah. and the impossibility of it, and that they ought to take the lead and ought to publicly announce the accomplishments of 96.5%. Right. Now, of course, that doesn't take care of getting out a statement yeah. from the administration that will indicate that the administration is going to go in on any of these cases where there may be a possibility of a federal violation. Yeah. You see this damn Williams. He wants to make it like another Lindbergh case, yeah. like the kidnapping, yeah. where there's a presumption of federal jurisdiction yeah. at the end of 24 hours. We would be in on every I case know. in the country. I know one work. Well, the interesting thing is that here you've got Williams doing this and Schweiker. Now, Schweiker. these two fellows are both doves. They're yes. both against uh, strong law enforcement and here they are out leading the charge. Well, of course, it's, many, it's, it's the same old thing of, yeah. of attacking you in the administration. Yeah. That's, That's right. what it really amounts to. They're not sincere in what they're doing at all. And, of uh, course, Williams is the last man who should have been, uh, been doing any talking. Uh, his background is such so bad that it ought to be looked into itself. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, there might be the place for some statement then if we could. Let me well, I'll tell you what, I'm not, we're not going to do anything if you can kick it around in your shop. I'm going to kick it around and here. And then raise it, and you and Mitchell, if you've got a recommendation as a statement that we could make, uh, uh, that is, understand, nothing has to be done to, uh, this week. Let's do it maybe next week. Yes. After our meeting. Uh, but we have to have a statement to come off of that meeting with the chiefs of police. I'll, maybe uh, maybe uh, by that time we could say that the FBI will do this. Or even repeat what we ordered in November. Yes. People forget what we what the FBI is already doing. Exactly. And, and the order in yeah. November was very sweeping. In right. And I... In fact, maybe we've got to take that and boil it down and hypo it and says the Bureau from do that and make it appear like a new thing. Exactly. See, and, and, and put any new element in it that you can. I'll get to work on that today. Figure, talk with the Attorney General today figure, about it. Figure thing. Now, now, let me say, there's no urgency. I don't want to do any, uh, we don't, uh, it's Memorial Day weekend, I we want to do it. But you, you talk to the Attorney General and say that we want to get a way to state this so that it's a new story when we hit it on Wednesday. Fine. Thursday. Fair I'll enough. Take, I'll take care of that. There, you work out some. I'll, I'll, I'll do that, Mr. President. Thank you. President Nixon and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover from May 28th, 1971. Five weeks later, the president and FBI director talked about how the Supreme Court needed a makeover following the Pentagon Papers decision. 
I wanted to tell you that I was so damn mad when that Supreme Court had to come down. I did, first, I didn't like their decision, but I didn't either. unbelievable, wasn't it? It was unbelievable. You know, those clowns we've got on there, I, I'll tell you, I hope I outlive the bastards. Well, I hope yeah. you do, too. Uh, I mean, politically, too, because by, we've got to change that court. I, there's no question yeah. about that whatsoever. Yeah. I thought it was a possibility of a five to four. Yeah. You know, I thought I thought we ought to get white. What's the matter with him? I don't. Well, of course, with a white is a yeah. whole Kennedy yeah. crowd. Right. You know. But then the other one know what in the hell is the matter with Stewart? Well, Stewart is a is a it, very wishy-washy individual. He switches from one side to yeah, the other. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I wasn't surprised that he yeah. on this thing he switched. Yeah. Well, I suppose he's affected with the Georgia, the Georgetown thing. But what I was going to say is that uh, that uh, the uh, uh, that when I was the day we went over to to your place and I was trying to, uh, we all we, it made the news all right. But uh, the news. but the point is the point is that if if it hadn't been for that stinking court decision, we'd have been the lead story, you know. It would have been the lead story. Yeah. And it should have been. And it, it should yeah. have been. Your, your remarks were simply wonderful, yeah. I thought. Well, we got, I thought it was good to lay it on the line with those fellows. And you know, you know that line that the era of per permissiveness is in that. And you notice, I thought it was really great to when I said, and I hope that you had what your people get this one down, because it, in the 23 years that I've known the director, that he has always, he has never served a party. He has always served right. his country. That sort of summed it up, didn't it? It did. And I, I ordered today that a copy of your speech came over from the White House today. Yeah. And I ordered that it be printed in our national in the uh, law enforcement bulletin, which oh. goes to about 1,500, uh, 15,000. Uh, law, uh, uh, police departments in Good. the country. Oh, that's fine. So it'll, it'll well, be in I, there. I wanted to get out of there, but I, but it, it got some, it got some, uh, got, a, got a good play, and I was glad to, glad that we could uh, could give it a shot. Well, because, I deeply appreciate yeah. what you did because it, it certainly was wonderful of you to do it. Yeah. And well, it, I wanted to. <laughs> I, mean, I know you may have wanted to, but yeah. it was wonderful to do it at a time when they've been shooting from all sides at you, you know. Oh, heck. As far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, you know, one thing I was going uh, to ask your question. A, a lot of people have a feeling that I ought to, uh, not a lot, Some if they're all mixed, as a matter of fact. Some people think that now that this court has acted that I ought to make a statement about the freedom of the press and that we are trying to censor them and so forth. My inclination, uh, whatever is worth, is not to say so. I'll tell you. I think you're right. Uh, I, I kind of think I should stay out, but what's your, what's your public relations judgment on it, Edgar? I'd just public like to know. Public uh, relations judgment, uh, uh, Mr. President, is that you should remain absolutely silent about it. You would, huh? I would. Now, what's your, now you, you don't think that uh, that that's uh, any great problem that they, uh, they've been, uh, uh, you know, that naturally been charging that we have been trying to keep the press from printing the truth about well, the war I don't and so think forth. That, that's involved because, as a matter of fact, these papers don't harm you one bit. No, actually, that story's in the, in the in the, in the post and time this morning were all about Kennedy and Diem. Kennedy, he was the one who started it, and then yeah. Lyndon Johnson escalated it, and then you inherited it, and you have brought it down. You never sent an additional man in there, but you brought it down. Yeah. And I think what they're trying to do is to bait you into, into taking a position that uh, the freedom of the press ought not be to that, to that extent. And yeah. I think we ought to be awful careful what we do in this case of this man Ellsberg. Because there again, they're going to make a martyr out of him. All of the press of the country are going to cause, come to the front end uh, that he's a martyr. And when you, what the Supreme Court has now said, uh, I doubt whether we're going to be able to get a conviction of him. Mm -hmm. I hope so, but I doubt it. We've got a good strong case on him. Mm -hmm. And his wife, test his first wife testified very uh, vigorously against him. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a good strong case. But well, I'd like to check some of the other people around him. That's the others. There's, I think exactly. there's a conspiracy involved here. Well, Sheehan of the New York Times is involved. This fellow Jack Anderson here in Washington, that skunk that we have here. Is he in it too? Oh yeah, he's in it. He was at the at the post yeah. and had copies made. Yeah. I saw her on the TV last night, Mrs. Graham. I would have thought she's about 85 years old. Yeah. She's only about, I think, uh, something oh. like 57. Oh no, I know that. Yeah. And I, I had an idea she was a great deal older when I looked at her last night. Yeah. She's aged terribly. She's a terrible old bag. Oh, she's an old bitch in my estimation. <laughs> That's right. 
But uh, I, I, I think from your point of view, it would be very advised. You don't think we should, I should say anything? I don't think point. you should say anything. I, I, Just let it cool off. Let the papers come out and let them reflect on whoever they reflect. What they want to print, it doesn't reflect upon you. You had nothing to do with all of this. No, I had nothing. To, that, not, nothing of what it's about me, you know. Not at no, all. Therefore, thing. if you enter it now on the grounds of freedom of the press or anything of that, then they'll, it's the very thing that the enemies of, of the administration want to do is to divert the attack upon you. And not upon Kennedy and not upon Johnson. Now, of course, I think what's going to happen, I think Lyndon Johnson will ultimately burst forth himself. Yeah. Because... He ought to. You know, he's a tough individual. He ought to defend himself. He, I, I, yeah. I think he will. Yeah, well... And, and I think for that reason, yeah. your silence would be just the thing. Well, I don't certainly plan to say anything until I have a chance to look over the weekend I, and see what the... Well, I, and, I, I, uh, I waited very yeah. carefully because, because I think they're trying to bait you yeah. into taking the position. This fellow Staffan, who's now going to be cited by the Congress for contempt of court, yeah. uh, he shot his mouth off today. And uh, I, think the, I think the House of Representatives will cite him for contempt. <laughs> he ought to be oh, cited for contempt. Yeah. But uh, uh, let that be yeah. his battle, not yeah. yours. Yeah, I'm not... Oh, I'm not having nothing to do with him. That's the House. That's the House. It's up to let them. Let them have their fun. And they had a unanimous vote in the committee. It wasn't divided. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's up for him to fight out. He right. talked about the opinion of yesterday as being in his favor and so forth. It has nothing to do with, with what the House is doing. Well, the, other, the opinion yesterday had nothing to do with the Pentagon. None with uh, with uh, 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 selling the Pentagon. They had lied about the Pentagon. As they've lied about so many things. Yeah. CBS yeah. is one of the worst yeah. networks yeah. On, the, right. on the circuit today. Right. But I would certainly give awful careful thought but well, we're just remaining silent yeah. well I, I, I'm glad to get that advice I'm going to be meeting in about an hour with these guys and I'll uh, I'll have that in mind fine well good to talk to you and, uh, and I want to thank uh, you again for yeah. the well, well I appreciate the cufflinks <laughs> it was wonderful uh, I appreciate the cufflinks thank bye. you goodbye uh, from July 1st 1971 FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and President Nixon fast forward now to November 22nd 1971 and the FBI had made an arrest in the New York City police killing. John Ehrlichman just came in and uh, brought your letter telling me that you'd caught those five uh, killers, those uh, uh, killed as uh, those two uh, policemen in New York. That's right, we did. That's just great. What are, how are you going to, I hope you make a hell of a lot out of the announcement at some time. Well, we were, we were trying to do that. Yeah. Because uh, the, it, was, it was an awful involved, long case. As a matter of fact, we, we arrested most of them out in California. I'll be darned. Yeah, I know. that they, It's a fantastic story. I, I just, uh, just uh, thumbed through it. It's really a really a really a great one. Now tell me, does that jackass Murphy know you've done it? Have you told him? I imagine by now he does. Because the only thing I'm concerned about, I wouldn't want him to step in and you know, uh, you know how he'd play it and take the credit for it. I'll take care of that all right. You will. <laughs> Well, I have no use for him anyway. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that this is a this is really a great thing. It is. And uh, these are just five uh, terrorists, is that right? They're they're the five of the uh, of the Black Panther type. And uh, you uh, you can go. Well, I'm just just delighted because it's a it'll have a darn. I'd be interested, Mr. President. Yeah. You've got some awful good leads on the killing of these Negro girls by this uh, so-called Phantom. Here, in, yeah. The district. Yeah. Oh, you have. Got some awful good leads on that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't good. know how they'll turn out, but they. Yeah. Right. Yesterday and today, there were two very yeah. good leads. Yeah. That we might have the real person. Yeah. yeah. This is, a, this is a good one, and I just say, as I say, just uh, you be sure the boys over there know that I I think it's just great, and I, when you get the, but I just want to be sure the Bureau gets the credit, Edgar, you know what I mean? I'll, I'll uh, that's done. <laughs> okay, because uh, this is, uh, I think a country will be just, uh, that, I'll never forget, that had an enormous effect in New York, remember, the funeral for the Italian, you know, and everything. I want to tell you what a wonderful uh, appearance I think you made down there at uh, Miami, because well, you know, I, I didn't want to take on old George Meary because he's been a good fellow on many issues, but uh, you just can't let anybody say that the president knows what he can do, you know. Well, you know, uh, the, the, the reaction already, uh, the, I've been noticing the ticker today, the reaction among the labor leaders has been that it's done them more harm than good by the way he acted. Yeah, I see, I see. In other words, the uh, almost insulting manner in which you were treated. Uh, is, is, is it's backfiring on them. And I think for that yeah. reason, he's not going to gain any any footage out of it. But we have to stand up to him, Edgar. The point is that everybody wants... We have to advocate and let them yeah. the country. And we simply cannot have this wage price push. Uh, and so... Uh, and he 
county represents, as you know, there are only 18 million organized laborers, and there are 62 million that are not in unions, so you got to think... You have to hear him talk, you think he had the whole country organized. That's right, that's right. But, uh, I appreciate that. I, I, as I said, I just went down there, and I, I was very, very pleasant, but very firm. No, you were, you, you, you were cool throughout. I, yeah. I saw it on TV. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on, on your favorite network, CBS? <laughs> no. Incidentally, NBC, yeah. you part of that network away today, you know. Who? The Graham gave part of that network away today. Is that right? The WTOP FM she gave to Howard University. Oh, that's nice. And I that's where it belongs. That's nice. <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, I'm just delighted with this, uh, and I, I just want the... I'll see that it's taken care of. I want the Bureau, though, to get the credit, you know, because, you know, we... That all right. We're, uh, we're fighting these... Uh, when these people raise questions, I can point to things like that. But exactly. But if you can, uh, as soon as you... When you're ready to make the announcement, be sure to let... Have one of your boys let John know so that I can have Ziegler comment on it here. I'll will you? that. So, you know, so, so we can then say this is a great thing. I want... I, 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 we'll give it a shot from over here, too. I, I'll, I'll let him know. Fine. I'll get on top of it right and if you get one on that other one, on the one here in the district, also let us know, because then you see Ziegler can go out, Edgar, and say the president was delighted to learn. And I think it's good that they know that I'm... Uh, that, that you have been personally interested in it. Right. And that I've been following it, and when you announce, you can say you've reported to me, and I'm pleased, and so forth. Fair enough? Uh, in, in other words, uh, yeah. there have been five or six of these colored girls who yeah. were raped and killed. God, that's awful, isn't it? And you've got a good lead there, huh? A very good lead. Is a fellow whose wife happened. Does it, look, niece. does it look like one or several? Just one. One person. And he has a background of the, yeah. the St. Elizabeth over here. The oh, boy. Psychiatric. Uh, is, is he black? Black. Yeah, yeah. And it looks as if we've got a pretty good lead there. Oh, boy. So we're trying to hold it very tight. Yeah. All right. I won't say a word. <laughs> okay. The FBI was already dealing with unprecedented scrutiny over its power when Richard Nixon took office in 1969. Congress responded by requiring Senate confirmation of future FBI directors and limited their tenure to 10 years. On May 2nd, 1972, with the Watergate affair about to explode onto the national stage, J. Edgar Hoover died of heart disease. He was 77. Be seated, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with a profound sense of personal loss that I learned of the death of J. Edgar Hoover. This truly remarkable man had served his country for 48 years under eight presidents as director of the FBI with unparalleled devotion and ability and dedication. For 25 years from the time I came to Washington as a freshman congressman, he's been one of my closest personal friends and advisors. And every American, in my opinion, owes J. Edgar Hoover a great debt for building the FBI into the finest law enforcement organization in the entire world. I have ordered that all flags on government buildings be flown at half-mast. But I will say that in doing so, that Ed Hoover, because of his indomitable courage against sometimes very vicious attack, has made certain that the flag of the FBI will always fly high. J. Edgar Hoover was the first civil servant in U.S. history to lie in state at the Capitol. On May 4th, President Nixon eulogized his friend at the National Presbyterian Church in Washington. The greatness of Edgar Hoover will remain inseparable from the greatness of the organization he created and gave his whole life to building the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He made the FBI the finest law enforcement agency on the earth, the invincible and incorruptible defender of every American's precious right to be free from fear. Yet America has revered this man, not only as the director of an institution, but as an institution in his own right. For nearly half a century, nearly one-fourth of the whole history of this republic, J. Edgar Hoover has exerted a great influence for good in our national life. While eight presidents came and went, 
while other leaders of morals and manners and opinion rose and fell. The director stayed at his post. He was one of those unique individuals who by all odds was the best man for a vitally important job. His powerful leadership by example helped to keep steel in America's backbone and the flame of freedom in America's soul. He personified integrity. He personified honor. He personified principle. He personified courage. He personified discipline. He personified dedication. He personified loyalty. He personified patriotism. Following J. Edgar Hoover's death, Congress thoroughly investigated the FBI about its role in the Watergate affair. It found that the agency had illegally protected President Nixon from investigation. When the CIA was formed in 1947, Richard Helms was one of its original architects, and he was the first career spy to lead it. His years at the agency covered the Cold War, a period in which CIA service was seen as a noble and romantic calling. But by the time he left, the CIA was looked at suspiciously by many and about to undergo intense congressional scrutiny over everything from assassination plots against foreign leaders to spying on U.S. citizens. We begin on April 11, 1972, just 15 days before President Nixon announced his Vietnamization plan. Good afternoon, Mr. President. I I was talking to uh, Henry this morning, and he was indicating that uh, uh, your reports had uh, pointed out that the North Vietnamese were not uh, broadcasting the fact that the B-52s were had hit them. Is that actually the case? Yes, sir. I believe it to be. Yeah. Can I uh, ask uh, you to... Uh, to go forward on your own way. You, you, we've got broadcasts in there, I presume, and all the rest, haven't we? Yes. And, uh, well, to, to get in as much as you possibly can, I should have thought this before, with regard to, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> not only the, the, stri- the strikes that have that have taken place, but, but building it up beyond that, naval units on the move, more right. B-52s coming and so forth. Right, sir. Uh, would, you, would you be sure that that is covered adequately so that it gets in? I don't know. How effective are those broadcasts in there? Do people pick them up or not? Yes, sir, they do indeed. And uh, I can certainly handle this, and I will undertake it immediately. Fine, if you would. I want to be sure that since they're not mentioning it, we sh- we do. But mention also the, the number of naval ships that are coming out, the more carriers, more B-52s, and the fact that this strike did take place or whatever it is. Okay? I'll do it, sir. Bye. Thank you. On June 16th, the two talked again about Vietnam, the Soviet Union, and China. As the call begins, they spoke about the president of Mexico. Hello. Good morning, Mr. President. Nick, I just left the president of Chavaria. He took me aside. You know, he doesn't speak much, I speak in English, but he says, I'm seeing uh, Director Helms this afternoon. And I said, good. I said, he's, uh, you can, uh, you know, he, I, I, he has authorized it directly to you from me. Right. So you, you should tell him that I talked to you and so forth. I don't know what games we're playing there, but he's strong. He's, yep. uh, he wants to play the right games. I had told him, I gave him a little fill in Russia and China. I said, no. But I said, no, we've had all these initiatives, but let me make one thing clear. I have no reason to believe that both nations are going to continue their support of subversion in other countries. I said, that's just, I said, we have agreed on no overt confrontations in effect. But I said, this is what you've got to expect. And I think, uh, so uh, that's the right sort of, the, I, we didn't go into any of the other domestic things he has. But, uh, so. Uh, well, thank you very much, sir. So, I will, uh, we are, uh, Dick Walters is going with me and we're going to have about an hour's chat with him. I went into the, why we had to finish Vietnam in the right way, why it was important for us to hold the, the ring against uh, aggression on all over the world, uh, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, uh, because nobody else was there to do it. And uh, he's uh, he's on our side, all right. Oh, that's okay. great, Mr. President. Thank you very much. All right, fine. In November 1972, just after he was reelected, President Nixon asked Richard Helms for his resignation. The result, Mr. Helms believed, of his refusing to let the agency be used in the Watergate cover-up. Two months later, the two talked about Richard Helms's new job 
as U.S. ambassador to Iran. Nick, I'm sitting here talking to John Ehrlichman, and I was wondering when you could get out to Iran, how soon you could get out there. Well, I've been planning to go about the middle of March. Middle of March? Yeah. Oh. Because I haven't, uh, I haven't oh, placed, uh, oh, yeah. got to get myself briefed, and I've got to that letter from you, which uh, yeah. I've got to do a lot of work on that energy problem. Well, let me, let me say this. Uh, I wonder, uh, uh, for, uh, it's, uh, have you been confirmed yet? I'd asked Fulbright about it, because I told him, and uh, said that I wanted you confirmed especially, and he said he would. <laughs> well, I think it'll be next week. And, uh, See, the Johnson death set it up. But, right. but, but, Joe is still out there, you know. Oh, I know that. I know that. Uh, I see. I see. Well, well but he'll be... He's leaving, he's leaving until the end of February. Oh, yeah. Because the Shah gave him a mission to do before he left. He yeah. him to travel around and see the Iranian industrial production. And yeah. For yeah. He gave yeah. him some help yeah. when he got back here. Well, that may be what we're talking about. What I would like for you to do is this, uh, have a talk with John at your... At, uh, next week sometime, would you? Yes, sir. And, uh... The Iranian oil thing is, you, is in a, apparently one hell of a situation at the moment. And, and did, you, did you talk to Connolly, or you're going to? Or? going to. I wanted to get myself educated a little bit before Fine. I talked to him. Well, the first, for a sense. I would say the first man to talk to is John Erdman. Right. And then Flanagan, who's made a study. Read the whole thing. Right. And what I want to do is that uh, if you're not going to march, maybe we can find a way to expedite it so you could even take a trip. You could take a trip even now, couldn't you? Oh, I could travel out there, certainly. Well, what we have and what I have in mind, I've talked to uh, everybody here thinks it's a great idea. I, uh, and uh, 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 I must talk to Henry about it. What I really have in mind is for you basically to be sort of the, without downgrading the other ambassadors, the ambassador in charge of that sort of area, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. Particularly with the, so you could go down to those sheikdoms and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, these other places and 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 pull this thing to, uh, and then give us the recommendation you know see what i mean I got it. so i think a trip of that sort would be very worthwhile let me suggest this you come in to uh you have a talk with john ehrlichman at the earliest possible time right have a talk with uh and with Connolly, uh, the Connolly thing's a little sensitive because he represents some clients, but he'll, uh, but on the other hand, you should talk with him. Right. Then, and then uh, sometime next week, perhaps Wednesday or Thursday or so, maybe the, toward the end of the week, because I'm going to be tired the first of the week, uh, we can, uh, we'll try to go over the thing. All right, sir. And, uh, uh, but my view is that you probably ought to take a trip fairly soon. In other words, uh, you know the Shah well, right? Yes, sir. And you could do it. I don't think it's any problem with Farland, but you, you, you better think about that and, and talk to, uh, if you think it's too sensitive to go out there to hurt, uh, hurt anything like that, but you're still the director of the CIA, right? Yes, sir. Well, that's... Uh, well, why don't I talk to these gentlemen and see what yeah. the score is here? Right. Maybe I can come up with a recommendation then. All right, fine. You talk and we'll uh, we'll work something out because I don't want. I'd like to get it, get it since you're going to be in charging. I'd like to get you in in the deal now before it. Uh, be frankly, before it blows. Right, sir. Yeah, you know, then when it blows, we can blame you. <laughs> okay, Great. you've been through that before, haven't you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank right. you, Mr. President. From January 5th, 1973, a call between President Nixon and CIA Director Richard Helms. Next time on Presidential Recordings, with the full scope of the Watergate conspiracy uncovered and articles of impeachment looming, President Nixon makes a historic decision. Our thanks to NixonTapes.org, the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, and the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. And in Season 1 of Presidential Recordings... Your secretly recorded conversations President Lyndon Johnson made on topics including the Warren Commission, the Vietnam War, the March on Selma, and more. And remember to follow presidential recordings so you never miss an episode. <laughs>